Well, I hope you're feeling better than I am today. Not that my spirit isn't high, but I kind of feel like, you know, the third monkey on the ramp to the ark and it's starting to rain, you know, but that's why you fight, right? You fight through that. And uh, so it is by God's grace that we do that today. It's good to be with you. Be back from uh, a week away. Trust me, it was no, it was no vacation uh, up to my eyes in mud, but uh, the Lord is good. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jay. I'm one of the pastors uh, serving here at the gathering. I'm uh, very glad uh, to have you with us today. You know, there are hard things to understand for me this past week, some hard uh, realities, things that were hard for me to understand, to explain. Uh, maybe the same is uh, for you uh, this week and all of your adventures here and there. Uh, for example, uh, see things hard to understand, uh, hard to explain. What about uh, describe a color to someone without using the name of the color or pointing to it? Describe it. Well, try to explain the difference between left and right. Describe what language deaf people think in. <laughs> Try to describe what water tastes like. Or how about this one? What does genuine faith look like? What does genuine faith not look like? That's what we'll be exploring from the text today as we look at essentially uh, two groups, uh, two blind groups, a couple of blind people on one side and some Pharisees who were blind on the other side. But first, let's talk about what does genuine faith look like. As we read, there are these two blind men, and uh, here they're going to show us at least four things about what it means to have faith in the Lord Jesus in uh, your broken world. Uh, like not just the, you know, the doctrinal statement that uh, in, you know, we intellectually assent to, but what does it actually look like? What does faith look like? What's the experience of having uh, a faith in the Lord Jesus in, in this life? These, these blind men are, are going to help us, and they're going to teach us uh, four things about what it looks like to, uh, to not just see it, but overcome uh, weakness and bro- blindness and weakness and, and brokenness. And you know, the crowds and the Pharisees are, are going to help contrast that faith uh, by showing us that we can be around Jesus and not have faith in him. So here's the first thing that we're going to feel and experience of faith. It's, it's this. Genuine faith professes the need for Jesus. Genuine faith professes the need for Jesus. We read right off the bat, Jesus passed on from there. We remember that he was at Jerry's house, if you were listening to last week's sermon, or Jairus, uh, going from one place to another, probably maybe going back to his own house in Capernaum, or maybe going back to, to, to uh, Matthew's house. Uh, we're not sure, but he's going back to a house, and two blind men followed him. And they are crying aloud. And the grammar is really interesting because they are not stopping as they're crying. They are yelling out consistently, likely as loud as they possibly could, hoping that Jesus would hear them. And their, their message was this, have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. This has been such a, a theme really throughout all of this series, but it bears uh, repeating that faith is an expression of neediness. Faith is an expression, I need you. And all you need to get around Jesus and to experience his power is recognizing your need. He does all of the rest. In fact, if we go really deep into it, even the whole aspect of your need is not really your own to discover. God will bring that, reveal that to you. In fact, if you're a reader of the Bible, you'll realize uh, that's not something that you can conjure even yourself. So God gets all the glory for all of his grace. My friends, this this brings me to this conclusion this week is that you don't need strength and you don't need morality. We we don't need to be put together at all. It's just the trust that Jesus is the only person who can heal me in all of the ways that I so most desperately need. And, And what do these blind men say? Look back here at verse 27. Have mercy on us, son of David. They cry out, we are needy. And you are unique. Their focus is on Jesus. I'm sure lots of people could peddle a lot of different things, but their focus is on the one that they know to be the remedy, the one that is unique. 
This is the, the first time in the gospel according to Matthew that he's called by what uh, is known as the Messianic title, Son of David. Jesus is the only one we read about in all of the Bible who gives sight to the blind. And so here is an interesting parallel uh, we look back at the hope of the people of Israel and, and the people of Israel who would have been very well versed in passages of scripture, but blind men in particular would have loved the Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 passage that promised that when the Messiah came, he would actually be able to do this. He alone would be able to bring sight to the blind. And so they call upon the son of David. If you are the son of David, have mercy on us. Isaiah 35 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame men leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Friends, the blind men are not just throwing out complimentary platitudes to try to win over Jesus. They knew that if, if, if Jesus could actually help them, then he was the Messiah. He was the son of David. You see, the logic of the Old Testament was whatever, uh, wherever God's king is, that's where God's kingdom is. Wherever God's kingdom is, that's where uh, people flourish the most. God's promise was, I'm going to bring my kingdom through David's line. And, and when they recognize that Jesus is the son of David, they're recognizing and saying, you're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one that Israel has hoped for. You're the one the world desperately needs, and we're needy, and you are strong. And so, listen, faith is not strong when you feel like you have everything together. Faith is at its strongest when you are aware of just how weak you actually are. Faith is strong when you are aware how broken and how needy you actually are. And so in a sea of needy people, we've got two dudes crying out, have mercy on us. Shouldn't there have been an anthem roaring up from everyone? Because they're all blind. And yet two men raise their voices and faith is not strong when you just are, you know, introspective and when, you know, when you hate yourself and you're, you know, self-loathing because of your sin. That's not faith in Christ. Faith says all that weakness and all that pain and all these hurts, I know, I'm going to place it onto his strong shoulders. And, and I can have confidence when I call out because he hears me. It may not look like he's hearing me, but he hears me. This is why suffering and trouble and pain in the Christian life can build your faith in a strong and strange way. Why? What does suffering and difficulty teach us? It teaches us I'm not in control. I'm not in control. It teaches us that I'm not actually strong enough. I'm not disciplined enough. I'm not put together. And yet my faith can grow. Why? Because it's rooted in my neediness and in his strength. And so first and foremost, before we move past it, I want to say it's crying out for mercy on me. My friends, if you are unsaved today, by that funny word unsaved, not a, really a Bible word, it, it's really the word lost. We're just a really polite people. You're lost, you're without hope in the world, and you know that, w that when you die, you're not, gonna be, you're not right with God, and you're going to have to face the judge of God. You know this, and that judge will hold you accountable for your sin. You need to cry out and cry out now as Jesus passes this way, son of David, have mercy on me. Mercy. It's interesting, this word mercy, because they would have, to, to use that, they would have had to know something not only about, about God and his willingness to help, but their need. I mean, why not? Hey, can you help us here? Can you make us well? There's a mercy side of it. So, so if, if, looking at this, the text doesn't tell us, but you have to somehow think maybe just a little bit that, that they had an awareness of what was the cause of their blindness. And did they know that, that maybe the cause of their blindness was sin? Now, not everybody who's blind, is, it's a result of their sin. But in the Bible, it is amazing to see how many times it's blind people that are blind because of sin in their life. Paul, you know, what, what's the first thing that happens to him when he sees the Lord Jesus, right? He's blind, right? There's, there's something about blindness 
that teaches about the spiritual reality of those without Jesus. They are blind. They are reaching in the darkness and they cannot find their way. We need mercy. Second, not only does genuine faith profess the need for Jesus, but secondly, this. Genuine faith persists even when God is silent. Genuine faith persists even when God is silent. Notice in verse 27, and as Jesus passed on from there, he just healed somebody. He's moving on uh, to the very next thing. The, uh, and, and notice the phrase, look at it, two blind men followed him. They, they followed him. Think about that. Think about, about what that actually looked like. Two blind men in a crowd are following. They're crying aloud to Jesus. Think about how clumsy and how slow they were. Think about how they, they didn't really know, what, what he, you know where he was at. They were just moving towards him generally. Think about the fact that they had never seen miracles before, that they had never seen for themselves Jesus heal anybody. They'd only heard. They're just like you. They'd never seen it. They never heard about it. They hadn't seen any of the miracles. They just, you know, heard that Jesus had healed people. And, and, and yet they are committed, no matter what, to get to him. And they cry out to Jesus. And listen, I want you to notice that this from the text again. They cry out to Jesus. And Jesus, in the surprise of all of this, doesn't initially respond to them. They're crying aloud, have mercy on a son of David, but nothing. Have mercy on a son of David, nothing. They cry out to him and he doesn't respond initially. He doesn't doesn't speak to them until they get into the house where where he's staying. And And he heard them, but he didn't speak back at first. Now, why is that? Why would Jesus keep walking when two blind men are trying to be healed by him or you know, they're shouting out for mercy to this son of David. If he wanted to heal them, why, why isn't he just doing it on the spot? He, he can do that. We've, we've come to that understanding as Matthew has been pushing us to see that this Jesus is the Jesus of authority. This is God in the flesh. But it, it kind of seems super strange. Don't, do, you not, do you not think that? It's kind of strange. Well, we're, we're, we're not told explicitly in this text what Jesus is, is in tending here, but I think from the context, I think you can see it. It's multifaceted. There's something here. But, but if we all have different opinions, let's just maybe agree on one. Can we agree on one thing? Let's agree on one minimum thing. Here's why Jesus isn't responding. He didn't want to heal them publicly because he was concerned about, I think, the crowds and, and how they would interpret this ministry. I mean, they're hearing these words, son of David, Right? And, you know, it's hard for us to understand this, but for the Jews uh, at this point in time, when they hear the word Messiah, it's not just spiritual for them. When they hear the term Messiah, they have expectations. And if Jesus is going to respond to Messiah, then they're, they're strapping on their swords, right? It's, it's a political statement. It's a political expectation. And, a, and there will be societal expectations for what this means. And remember, Jesus isn't here to set up his kingdoms on earth as they would see that. There, he's here to die on the cross. He needs to get to Calvary. So he doesn't want to stir up their delusions of what he's like any more than he already has. And, and that's why I think that he tells us later on in verse 30, don't tell anybody doesn't want them to stir up the crowds into thinking he's something uh, that he's not. He is the Messiah, but, but a different one from the one that they're expecting. And, and other commentators would point out that this is Jesus, that it, he, he's testing their faith. They cry out to him. He doesn't respond to, to test to see if their faith is actually genuine. Uh, one of my faults, according to my better half, is that I use silly similes. Silly similes. Um, and I don't think they're silly. This is our ongoing disagreement, you know. Um, but similes are quite powerful. You know, he's as sharp as a bowling ball. What does that mean, right? Nobody knows what that means. He eats like a bird. Well, wait, hold on. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is he's eating very little food. But really, you know, a bird eats about 
six or seven times more per capita than a human does. So that, that doesn't really make sense. It's a silly uh, simile. It's sweating like a pig. They don't sweat, right? Uh, clean as a whistle. I mean, that would be kind of gross, right? You don't all use that whistle. Get some, you know, some antibacteria stuff. A fit as a fiddle. Sly as a fox. Snug as a bug in a rud. Or my all-time favorite, sleeping like a baby. Man, you've never had kids, <laughs> right? In a recent conversation with my wife, the phrase grasping at straws pop, popped out, which led to the question, where did this actually come from? And so I thought, I got to find out no more of this. So you, you find out when, when someone says they're grasping at straws, right? So I did this online search because Google knows everything. And what I learned was the origin of this phrase comes from a book by a man named Thomas More in his work, Dialogue of Comfort Against Tribulation. And now don't worry, it's not on your shelf. It was written in 1534. The idiom refers to a drowning man grasping for anything, even a straw to save his life. The straw, uh, in this case, refers to sort of, you know, thin reeds that grow along the bank. And though they're about to drown and they, they're just trying. They, they know that that's not a really sure thing by, by grasping after these weeds, but they'll do anything they possibly can it's like throwing darts at a board and hoping for the best. This is grasping at straws. Now, I want you to know this. My friends, Jesus is quiet toward their cries, not because he doesn't hear them and not because he doesn't care for them, but because he had different purposes for them. They're grasping at straws, but not really. And if you conclude for all of this that they're just throwing darts at a board or, or just, just doing anything to get Jesus' attention, that's fine. I, I'm not going to convince you at least from, from this text. But we know this, that what he had for them, they needed. And they needed it desperately. But yet Jesus doesn't respond to their cries. God, listen, God hears us. Uh, some people are, are really convinced after many hours and many days of crying out to God that God does not hear uh, me when I cry. My friends, there's not a prayer that you have ever prayed that he has not heard. You are not grasping for straws. When you speak out in faith and ask God to help you, to have mercy upon you, to save you, he hears he hears every time you pray, but, but hear this. You will not always get the immediate response that you're after. And the lack of response is not a sign that he has forgotten you and me. It's not a sign that he doesn't care about you or me. It's not a sign that he isn't real. It's a sign that he has different purposes for you in this moment. And those purposes could be to, to deepen your faith. Those purposes could be to teach you how to trust him in the waiting or to listen those purposes could be bigger than your own little life. The world doesn't revolve around your life or mine. Sometimes your story is for the benefit of other people. It's teaching other people how to trust God, your friends, your community, your city. It, you can imagine the crowd, wow, wow, if Jesus is listening to them, maybe he'll listen to me. What we really want is God to make us a people who still believe in God's authority and power to meet our every need to save and to heal us today. That's what we want. I hope you're beginning, it's beginning to stir in you that not just, not just the power in the past in the Bible, not just the power in the future in the resurrection, but we have power today because God the Spirit is with us to do the same thing that he's doing in the church for all time. And I and I want, again, to get in, you know, in your theology of healing here, if you're stuck here. Listen, every single prayer for the Christian uh, that asks God for healing will be answered. It absolutely will be answered. It's just a matter of when. Some of you, and I know, I know this, you've been praying for healing and you've heard nothing. Maybe since this series started, you began to beg God to heal or to save in a certain way or to move in a certain way, and you've heard nothing. You cried out to Jesus like the blind men, have mercy on me, son of David. And it doesn't seem like he's even turned around to notice you. You've cried out again and again, and he doesn't see you. 
My friend, silence from God is the appearance, as it may appear, is, is not true. You are reading into it. It can be very discouraging. I'm not diminishing it. I mean, the psalmists are constantly crying out, God, where are you? Crying out, where are you? I don't see you. Read Psalm 77. I read it this morning. Asaph, where are you? My friend, silence doesn't mean silence forever. That's not, it's not silence forever. Silence now from God. You know, there are things that have been going on in my life over the last six months that I have been praying and begging God for for, for 10 years that he's just now said yes to. Now, to be really clear, I, I wasn't praying straight for 10 years, um, but I started 10 years ago. I remember these things that I wanted so badly for God to do, I began to beg him for it. But like all of us, you know, you pray a little bit and you pray a couple of times and, you know, nothing seems to, to happen. So you pray a little bit more and then honestly, you kind of stop. You kind of, you know, give up. You know, I quit praying about the things that I wanted, the things I was longing for, the things that I thought I was made for. And then God, you know, he moves in your life. And even when you're not dreaming uh, about it, you know, it's kind of always there. You know, but God began to work things in my life and has been working things in, in my life. And then you begin to pray about it again, but then you give up again. You know, I've started praying again and again for this one thing. And in the last six months, he's begun to slowly reveal to me. And my, my cries were heard. He actually heard my heart. And, you know, it's a reminder to me that just because he was silent, just because I didn't think he was listening, just because he was quiet doesn't mean he didn't hear me. Every single one of those prayers he heard. Silence doesn't mean indifference. It doesn't mean different purposes. And you know what's fascinating? Looking back over the last decade, I'm really happy he waited so long. It's a weird thing to say. And I think a lot of people have the experience, you know, even if you, you're here and you're not a believer, you see it, you know, all the time. People will look back on their lives and they're, you know, there's a, a trying time when you didn't know, you know, what things will work out, you know, how it will work out. But then you look back at it and you're, you know, you're kind of thankful for it because there are things that happened to you along that period of time that just changed you for better, better through the trial, right? But for Christians, we look back and we see that in the waiting, in the waiting, God is tilling up the soil of my heart for different things. And in the waiting, he's getting us ready. Listen, in my waiting for 10 years for this thing, he was getting me ready to receive it as a gift and not a God as a gift and not a God. You see, he was getting me ready to get the gift, and here's what happens. We'll pray and go. God, give it, and he gives it to us. We'll go, great, idol. He's like, that's not why I gave it to you. Oh, it's so pretty. It's so precious. See you later, Lord. And that's what we do. But in the waiting, he's getting us ready. So when he does give it to you, we can go. It's a gift. It's not my God. It's not my God. That's what he was doing in, my, in me. And some of you are waiting and you're, you want to give up. And you see these two blind men and they show you when you don't hear God respond back, keep going after him because you have the right man. And he hears you. Keep going. Now, look at verse 28. It says, when he, Jesus, entered the house, the blind men came to him. And so they're shouting, have, have mercy on us, son of David. Nothing. And they think, well, he must have, you know, just want us to come closer. And so they move closer. And he goes into the house. And they're like, well, there's a door there. Let's open it. And here we go, right? They, they go into the house, and then Jesus speaks to them. So listen, even listen, even if you feel clumsy in your faith, even if you feel in the dark in your faith, these blind men remind us, just keep going. Get where Jesus is. Maybe he wants to heal you in private, not in public. Maybe our church is maybe going to learn something here. Maybe we're learning something now, something uh, from 
from our lives of prayer that, that we think we should be hearing yes, but we haven't heard yes, but we will hear yes. Maybe your non-believing friends are learning something from you as you wait, but keep going to where he is. Maybe God's teaching you to value him and not what you're asking him for. For so long, you've desired and you've coveted something that if you could only have it, you would just be at so much peace. That something is so prized that it consumes your thoughts, your time, your money. It takes your relationships. It decides where you live, what you keep, what you give away, what you say and what not say is what you want. And all of a sudden, before you know it, Jesus is a straw. And you're just grasping at it and at him. Because you must want, you must have what you, you think you need. You know, our faith then can be deflated. Your faith can be wearied, but God will not allow it to be extinguished. My friends, we need to read these small passages. We need to read these texts because they remind us that they've got the right man. They need to keep asking. Their faith will not be distinguished, extinguished. God won't shut that door and keep them out. He won't let your faith die. He'll keep it alive. So my friends, if I could encourage you from the text, be like these blind men and keep praying, keep crying to the Lord Jesus and follow him even when he is silent until he brings you to wherever he wants you to go. And so the second thing is faith persists even when God is silent. What does genuine faith look like? It professes the need. It persists even when God is silent. But third, genuine faith provides access to his power. It provides access to his power. Look again at verse 28. When Jesus is entering the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe do you believe that I am able to do this? And, and they said to him, yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open. How many things did Jesus ask them to do? Well, the only thing that Jesus asked them to do is to trust him to do what needed to be done. Do you believe that I am able to do this? He doesn't ask them about their morality. That's important. He doesn't ask them, well, how's your temple attendance been? Or how has your quiet time been this week? Notice you gave up on Leviticus again this year. That Bible app sure hasn't been, you know, open in quite a while. You know, he doesn't ask them about their track record. He doesn't ask them about their giving or their serving or their sexual purity or how they voted. He doesn't ask them those questions. He says, do you believe I am able? That's the scandal of the gospel, by the way. That the way you access God's power is by grace through faith. That's it. Now, you can use that to justify sin and all sorts of disobedience, sure, but... But we can never get away from the simple truth, my friends, that faith is all you need to access him. No matter how your day has been or week has been or your life has been, faith is all that you need to access Jesus. So, so in some ways, that's profound and simple. But in other ways, isn't faith, if you've been you know, following Jesus, the hardest thing to conjure up? I wonder what your answer would be just, just now. If, if I asked you right now, do you believe he is able to do this? Or maybe the thing in your life, the, the thing that you're you know, really doubting in your heart, do you believe God's able to do that? I would actually prefer him to ask me about my behaviors, actually, you know, because I could maybe show him the record of efforts I have made, but he didn't just ask me what, what I've been doing or my behaviors. Not because I'm, you know, so put together. <laughs> but it's easier to control. You see, that's why religion is always appealing. If I do enough, if I serve enough, if I give enough, if I abstain enough, I do this and I do that, then God will give me what I want. That's not what Jesus says. He says, do you believe I am able? Belief is, the, is, is a harder question. 
It's a tougher one to answer for us. And, and, and then what's incredible, they believe and he heals them. Again, the stories of healing are repetitive, I know, but let's not lose the glory of what is actually happening in this text. They're, 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 they're given sight instantaneously. Instantaneously, they're given sight. And this is actually a miracle that is unique to Jesus. So all the different miracles that we've read, God the Spirit has used other people to accomplish those things. Giving sight to the blind is only done by Jesus. In all of the Bible, I looked. All the, the Old Testament news, he's the only one who gives sight to the blind. The only one. And then Jesus makes the statement that is very easily misinterpreted. He says, verse 30, he says, He touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. According to your faith. Now, here's what happens. You can read this at, you know, at a surface level, and then you can you know, take from this text that God answers prayer in proportion to your faith. And so here's what happens. This teaching is prevalent and, and you know, it gets a little bit into our hearts and, and we have this mindset, if, if I have more faith, then God would always say yes. If I could just get to that level of faith, he would always, because it's according to your faith. If I could only believe more, my miracle would come. There's a problem with that. Listen, just flip over to the Garden of Gethsemane for a moment. Jesus says, Father, if there's any other way, let's do that. And God says, no. If there's any other way, God, let's do that. And the Father says, no. Do any of you want to argue with me that you have more faith than Jesus? It's a different conversation, right? Right? There's no one in here that has more faith than Jesus. And Jesus still hears the word no. So it's not according to as if somehow it's amount of your faith. It's not in proportion of the faith that God responds. Jesus isn't saying it's because your faith is so strong, my friend. Notice what the text says. It says according to your faith, not according to the amount of your faith. These, these words are very important for us, but we lose, we lose our sight of truth when we start to read in the text. That's why you need to read slower, slowly, every single word. How does this mean? We used to read differently, you know that? And we used to read slowly, and words meant something. Now we're just throwing words out everywhere. Not according to your faith, but a, not a, sorry, it's, it says according to your faith, not according to the amount of your faith. I think we get that, Yes. He's saying according to the fact that faith even exists in you, the fact that faith is present in you because what makes faith strong is not faith itself. It's the object of the faith that makes it strong. Jesus is the strong one. He says, do you believe I'm able to do this? So flimsy faith in Jesus is strong because of what? Because of him. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, it's, it, it's not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. People, you know, please listen to that. Please hear that. It's not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. Listen to Keller again. Strong faith is a weak branch. Sorry, strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. Take a moment to read that. Strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. A weak hold on Jesus, barely hanging on, is stronger than a tight grip on absolutely anything else. A drop of faith in Jesus is stronger than the greatest roaring waterfall of self-reliance. Don't fret when your faith is weak. Some people you rolled into here and you are falling apart. You are weak and you are desperately holding that smile together. You think you got everyone fooled except for the one person who matters the most. The Lord who sees right through that. Praise God that, that, that faith, that our faith doesn't have to be anything but flimsy, but we hold on to the one whose faith is, who's, who is the object of our faith. There's so many Christians 
who hate themselves because they think, and I should believe more. That's, that's not how Jesus sees it. Strong faith says, I am weak. Strong faith says, I am weak, but he is strong. Do you get that? The fact that you're struggling is the evidence of life. Dead people don't move. Please know that. Like you so often, Satan will take the most gentle, soft-hearted person in here and use these words to condemn them. And the hard-hearted people who don't care think they're just great. We can't fret when our faith is weak. Jesus is tender and gentle towards weak faith. He heals by it. He saves by it. Later on in Matthew 12, verse 2, listen to the prophecy of an Old Testament um, passage that talks about the Messiah. It says, Jesus, Jesus says a bru- about Jesus, a bruised reed he will not break. A bruised reed he will not break. We don't know anybody like this man. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. The idea is a bruised reed has no utility and no purpose or function at all. It's broken. It's bruised. It needs to just be trashed, thrown away, discarded. And Jesus says, I put my hands around a bruised reed, and I make sure and hold it up. A smoldering wick, not giving light to anything. He puts his hands around it and he fans it into flame. That's what Jesus does. He's gentle and he's tender toward your weak faith. So faith, no matter the amount, has access to his power. What does genuine faith look like? Well, it professes the need for Jesus. It persists even when God is silent. Genuine faith provides access to his power. But genuine faith protects us despite disobedience. It protects us despite our disobedience. Faith isn't canceled by it. Look, verse 31. This is a a really strange verse, I'll admit. You, You read this and it's like, wow, this is unfortunate. Jesus sternly warns them, see that no one knows about it. See that no one knows about it. So these men have just been healed. But they, you know, went away and they spread his fame through all the district. And so these these men, completely healed by Jesus, immediately disobey him. (laughs) Like immediately. I mean, he doesn't just say, you know, hey guys, free go, dap up, bro hug, tell nobody, see you later. That's not how it works. He says, look at the text. Sternly, he warns them. Jesus is saying, for real, for real, don't tell anybody, right? Like stern. Don't tell anybody and their disobedience. It's so brazen that when you read it, all of us, myself included, you're like, man, I mean, really? Is it really sin after all? I mean, you kind of wonder about that, right? Like you read it and you're like, I mean, maybe it's not a big deal because Jesus doesn't, you know, want his name to be spread. Maybe it's kind of a weird test for these guys. Say, don't tell anybody or should you? Is that what this verse is saying? (laughs) You know, you kind of, you read into that. I don't know. And you're here and you're like, you're thinking, you're like, oh no, evangelism. That's not what he's talking about. Okay. It's different. It's a different purpose. And you know, something's going on here. I I don't see it. But, But here, it's just so brazen. Church, hear me. Listen. Power and maturity are different things. Power and maturity are different things. You can experience the power of the Holy Spirit and not be mature. Just because someone is used powerfully doesn't mean their next action should be followed. What they just did was sin because to ignore Jesus' word, to rebel against it, to not obey it is sin. That's why Christians are so confusing. (laughs) This is why. If you've been following Jesus, I think you know this experience you have an experience where, you know, God shows up in your life. You know, he shows up and, you know, you're so amazed that he loves you. You're aware he's in control. You're aware that he's good and he's doing something. He's healing you. He's doing wonderful things. And then in 10 minutes, you're back sinning, right? It's, it's like every Sunday, right? It's like you don't get out of the parking lot, right? And you're, you're yelling at your kids. You're flipping the bird at somebody who cut you off in traffic. You don't do that. For people who get to, you know, serve, we never do that. You know, the, the, the pastor elders here, they never do that. We're, we're, we're an elite company of people who never do that. 
We all do this. We're confusing, but I want you to know this. Listen, our sin doesn't diminish what God has done. Our sin doesn't diminish what God has done. Just because you fail in the parking lot doesn't mean that he wasn't here. But also this, listen, our sin is not explained away because uh, God just moved in power. What God has done doesn't diminish the sinfulness of ignoring Jesus' word. These men were completely healed and they completely disobeyed. Both can be true at the exact same time. Even when with good intentions, we can disobey God. And I think this will help you understand yourself, understand maybe other people. That's what faith is like in Jesus, right? There's the, the, the faith through grace in Christ, but then you live it out and you're like, oh, it's complicated. I don't live like Jesus all the time. I'm clumsy. I fail. But that's okay because Jesus still wanted to heal you. <laughs> he still wanted to be your savior. He still wanted you in his family. It's not like to the curb with her, right? What genuine faith is, this is what it is. But what is it not? We have just a few moments. I'm just going to blow through these really quick. Just two things here. Genuine faith is not the same as marveling. Look at verse 32. It says, as they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke and the crowds marveled saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Stop right there. Uh, it, it's a very quick telling. It, it's, it's incredible ministry to have uh, where Matthew's, you know, having to speed up and go, yeah, demon-possessed guy, couldn't speak, he was healed, whatever, and he moves on, right? He's going so quick because his purpose is not here to tell us every little detail about what's happening in this healing. His purpose is, I think, I think, if I read this correctly, is to tell you about the crowds and the Pharisees. The crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in all of Israel. We're not to view these people as gullible people who didn't know any better. Like, yeah, demons get cast out all the time. No big deal. Don't think because we're further on in history that we're smarter or better than them and we're more perceptive or sophisticated than they are. When they see this, what do they all say? Never was anything like this done in all Israel. All of them are in awe of it and none of them know what to make of it. But here's what you need to know about the crowds. They marvel at Jesus, but they don't have faith in him. They love the Chosen series, but they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Crowds are always portrayed as people who are around Jesus, but they're never committed to Jesus. And so they're all for Jesus when he's displaying his power and when he's teaching on topics that they care about. And when he's critiquing the people they think they, you know, that they think need it, he's like, yeah, to the man. But when he begins to challenge them to love him above everyone else, they pull back. When he begins not to just to critique them, but to move that critique from the, their enemies and the powers over them to them themselves. And not just critiquing our sins, but critiquing our love and the order of our loves. When he moves, he, he, he moves the line and he asks us to give up everything for him. We pull back from him. And listen, I sincerely, if you've checked out lock back in now for, just for a moment. I, I wonder how many of us are in this camp. If you're a Christian and you're struggling and you're being tempted, let's say you've experienced his power before. Let's just say you've, you've had moments when it's been clear to you God is real. God, you know, you can't deny that. His, his presence is active. You've benefited maybe from other Christians in a season of crisis. You've been, you know, helped by a sermon you know, you love the Christian bumper stickers, uh, you know, the Bible podcasts, and you've been to a Christian counselor before. You've, you've even found yourself reading the Bible and marveling at Jesus. Oh, I love this Jesus guy. But here's the question you need to ask yourself. Has Jesus become singular for you? The only thing for you. The only thing that matters. Does he stand out in your life? Is there anybody who exercises the same amount of authority over you as he does. And so as we're quick to criticize these Pharisees, we who know Jesus, we are quick to marvel, but not affirm him as the Lord of our lives in everything. You say, I didn't get that from that section. This is what God laid on me this week. So sorry if I am just telling you what God laid on me. Oftentimes, 
you know, we just marvel and we forget. He is our Lord and he calls us to respond. And if you were not saved today, my friends, stop the marveling alone and cry to him. Genuine faith is not about marveling, but the last thing is genuine faith is not going to impress the cynics. Listen, but the verse 34, the Pharisee says he casts out demons by the prince of demons. These Pharisees, they can't deny the fact that Jesus is casting out demons. It's just too apparent that uh, what's just happened and what they, but what did they do here? How do they respond? They, they, they refuse to believe. As good cynics do, they see through what's going on, what's really behind this. That's what cynicism is, right? It's seeing through something that is good, but saying, here's the real motivation. Can you relate to that? Oh, you think that's good, but here's really what's going on. Oh, he casts out demons, but by the prince of the demons. He may be powerful, but he's actually using it to get your vote. He's actually using it to woo you into his schemes, to woo you into his intents. He's actually using it to get you to leave your faithful life of God, to leave the faithful, thoughtful, loving, good life for God. Listen, I need you to hear this sentence, all right? There is no amount of seeing God's work that can convince a cynic that God can be trusted. Don't check out and think this is an overstatement. Here's, here's what I mean. There's no amount of seeing God work that can convince a cynic that God can be trusted. He's casting out demons and they will not be persuaded. I've been there, so hear me. I'm a cynic. You know, I was a cynic and I can be cynical. I can be cynical as a Christian. God is at work and I'm like, yeah, but is he really at work? You know, you hear somebody get saved. Yeah, but does that really matter? Maybe they'll fall away. Maybe they're not really saved. You know, maybe they'll grow in their faith, but maybe they won't. And so all of a sudden we see that the Lord is working among us and we're just cynical, right? So I've taken the view from a Christian perspective, not just from the, from the unbelieving Pharisees. I'm talking to us. I'm talking to us as a family. Can we become so cynical that we're, we're not right on the ready to thank God for the amazing things that he's been doing in our lives individually and in our church. Let's never get that way. Let's be thankful for all of it because we can trust the Lord in everything. So maybe that's just for me, <laughs> but hopefully God will use it to encourage you. So how does the Lord work? Well, the Lord works in these mysterious ways. We can see him working. And, you know, he does a couple of things in our lives. He teaches us just a few things, I think, from this text that are important for us, what genuine faith looks like, but also what genuine faith does not look like. May God add his blessing to the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we, as we think about these things, we are reminded, Lord, that we have different stories and hearts and circumstances uh, and some of us come together today and we are men and women of faith. But all of us, Father, need to be reminded that there are times when we do not hear your voice and we are tempted to think that you do not care. Father, help us to be mindful of the fact that you hear every prayer and that you're on the ready to heal us and help us in your time. Help us as the world tells us to focus on every other thing, to focus on you. It worked in our salvation as we kept our eyes upon you and our, we placed our faith in you, Lord Jesus. Help us to remember that our eyes must always be upon you. And Father, help us to, 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 to be prayerful, to be men and women of prayer, to remember that when we pray, Lord, we are not falling upon deaf ears. You hear us and you love us. Father, if there's anyone here today and they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, we pray, Father, today you'll give them two things. You'll give them repentance and you'll give them faith. Help them to cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.